Secretary General Hervé Ladsous uh, is one of the most senior people that we've hosted. He's been head of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations at the UN since uh, 2011. He has a very distinguished previous diplomatic career, joining the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1971, uh, has served uh, in a whole range of places before ending up as deputy perm rep to the UN in New York, uh, served uh, as French ambassador, et cetera, to the OSCE, uh, and had senior positions at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in, in Paris. And then he, he also was chief of staff for the French uh, Minister for foreign, foreign and European Affairs. Uh, has the interesting distinction of holding uh, a degree in law and a diploma in Chinese and Malay Indonesian uh, at the National School of Oriental Studies in, in, in France. But today the focus is on uh, UN, on the UN work and the peacekeeping, the vast array of responsibility that that represents. We're very delighted to have very senior members from the Department of Foreign Affairs and from the Defence Forces here with us, and a whole variety, if, you, if I could introduce you to everybody, I would, but a whole variety of <clears throat> people from a wide range of a spectrum of Irish life. So we're all waiting with great interest to hear what you have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone, and let me first thank very warmly the Institute of uh, International and European Affairs for hosting me and having such a large gathering. And indeed, the Secretary General retains very good memories of his uh, passing here and uh, asked me to convey his greetings. I'm very happy about this opportunity to speak about uh, the role of uh, United Nations peacekeeping, especially here in the capital of a country which has been so committed over years and decades to being peacekeepers, you know. Uh, you have done an incredible effort over many years, uh, in many circumstances. Right now, uh, you have uh, very brave people in uh, Golan Heights, in uh, Lebanon. Uh, we had very interesting talks this morning with the Minister of Defense and with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I think this is an appropriate place to uh, tell you about how we see uh, our work, what we're trying to do to both try and make a difference on the ground and also to keep pace with a, a world that has been changing so significantly in recent years. So thank you for providing that forum. I think, uh, as I said, uh, it's been 30 peacekeeping operations altogether in which Ireland has uh, participated. Uh, and it illustrates, of course, the commitment of your country to international values and to all the ideals uh, that are those of the United Nations. Uh, it is illustrated also by uh, the considerable help you have given to uh, strengthening the relationship between the United Nations and the European Union, because if there is indeed a community of ideals and values, it is between those two entities. And uh, I was just uh, yesterday in the uh, semestral gathering of the Ministers of Defense of the European Union, and there is considerable interaction. I think right now there are no less than uh, 20 mission settings where we are working, whether in peacekeeping or in political uh, endeavors, uh, alongside and increasingly organically with the uh, EU. So that, I think, is uh, something to be uh, saluted. Today, and I'll just uh, not dwell more about it, but uh, I think that uh, your military are playing a very critical role in those places, the, the Golan Heights of uh, Lebanon, uh, which are so vital to maintaining at least some islands of stability in a part of the world which is prone to so much uh, disaster. And I think everybody agrees that uh, it is critical. As indeed you have placed a, a role in the past in Liberia, a mission that we are now, I think, uh, going to close before long because it has done the job. And I think uh, this is uh, something that has to be, you have to be commended um, for. So, uh, one word still about uh, European uh, endeavors for the common security and defense policy. 
I think uh, what was debated yesterday in Bratislava, of course, is uh, first is not for me to comment upon, it wouldn't be proper, and it's something very much in the making, but I think we can expect that there will be further developments along the line and that indeed uh, increased capability, increased agility on the part of the European Union will allow us to register more successes like the one we had in Central African Republic only two years ago when the EU decided to go along with a bridging force which did from the UN point of view a perfect job, perfect on substance, perfect in timing, perfect in coordination. So this is uh, probably some way uh, to go and I know that your country will continue to encourage that. In the context also where we just had three weeks ago a ministerial uh, meeting uh, hosted by the UK which was an opportunity for many countries from all over the world but especially from Europe and that included Ireland to pledge yet further capacity for UN peacekeeping. I think this is uh, absolutely uh, critical and element of great hope for the future. So all this is important because I think we are at a turning point. As we look at the international peace and security uh, landscape in 2016, we see that uh, UN missions increasingly are deployed earlier, much earlier in the span of a conflict. Uh, places where fighting, uh, more often than not, is still going on. And that was the case only three years ago in Central African Republic. In some cases, uh, we have to uh, do our work so as to protect civilians uh, and to maintain stability in environments which are completely unpredictable. Example, South Sudan today. Nothing can happen, anything can happen tomorrow. Resumption of fighting on a massive scale, uh, ethnically based, with enormous violence. I am those, uh, amongst those who believe that South Sudan already accounted for 60, 70,000 people killed, tens of thousands of women raped, at least 20,000 kids recruited by the armed groups. And this can resume tomorrow because the leaders don't care and there is no political process uh, emerging. Yet we're there dealing with this on a sort of uh, hand-to-mouth basis with 200,000 civilians that we, and there's no mistake, we had to do that. We took them on in our camps, on our bases. But it's a severe uh, weight on our people it's a severe constraint on what we can do elsewhere because we simply have to protect those people that the government considers as its enemies or quasi-soldiers who just need to go and dig out their weapons from wherever they are hidden in the bush nearby to resume hostilities. So, very complex situation and there is no uh, tidy, I would say, continuum from conflict to peace. It is a continuum, there's no question, but when does each situation start or cease to exist uh, is, uh, uh, is complex and in certain places it's true that uh, uh, we are ourselves fighting to support peace. The tools that we have, uh, more often than not, have been stretched to the limit. Uh, they are no longer a match to the new patterns of violence uh, when we see that every other day in Mali, almost, we, blow, we have a vehicle blowing on a mine, on an IED. Despite all that we have invested in uh, training, in equipment, uh, in technology in general, uh, well, touching wood, there's maybe a hope that it does less victims. But the number of incidents uh, has rather, in fact, increased. Uh, so uh, this is a huge uh, uh, challenge because it impacts on us and Needless to say, it impacts also on the populations that we are supposed uh, to protect. So this is why two years ago <coughs> we embarked on the uh, so-called uh, reviews of uh, peace operations, uh, but alongside a review on the peace-building architecture 
and alongside a review of the implementation of uh, Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. This was, I think, uh, an opportunity, a great one, to try and come up with ideas, proposals to adapt our tools to address those conflicts more effectively. It shows clearly where we are, sort of snapshot uh, reality check, uh, but also a pointer towards what it is and how it is that we could do uh, better. So I would like today to, to focus on uh, two areas uh, which I think are of particular relevance in your country. One is the protection of civilians and the other one is women, peace and security. As you know, for 15 years now or thereabouts, the Security Council has made protection of civilians the core of all our contemporary mandates. It's really the heart of the mission. It is the benchmark, rightly or wrongly, by which our efficiency, our effectivity is, uh, is judged. Uh, it is probably the most high-profile activity of our peacekeepers. And, uh, and yet, we are, I think, at some crossroads on protection. Uh, we have made a lot of progress in uh, conceptualizing, in uh, designing uh, policy, tools, strategy, uh, in the field, in headquarters. But uh, at the end, you know, um, it is more often than not a matter of life or death. Uh, I said in South Sudan, if we hadn't opened our camps to those 200,000 civilians, most of those people would be dead by now. <laughs> so there's no going back on that. But how to manage the, the, the net result is an incredible uh, uh, challenge. I was in uh, the north of South Sudan in Unity State in um, June before the incidents resume, incidents, the terrible violence resumed in July. <coughs> we were seeing a situation in Bentiu where very gradually uh, some people were returning uh, home or hinting that they might return home. But in Malakal, no such thing. Because near Malakal, the other side of the Nile, you have another community called the Shiluks with a rather nasty general called Oloni who was trying to, uh, or hinting that he was preparing an attack. So no way anybody wanted to move out. Uh, so what do we do? And there was a government of South Sudan official with me. He said, well, you might start by handing out some seeds and uh, so they can plant vegetables. I said, but no, we don't want to give them any encouragement to stay further, you know. Uh, we have to make it clear that protection is a necessity, but it, uh, there's a point where, you know, people have to consider returning home to their place <coughs> and to forego what it is that they get in camps, which is not negligible. They get medical services, they get food distribution, they get schooling for the kids, but that's not sustainable. So it's really a, a conundrum. <coughs> so what it is that we have to do, you know, to uh, address such uh, challenges? Um, first, I think uh, we have to build a, a much stronger consensus among the member states on uh, what the expectations are on, uh, in this area and about the will to protect the civilians. There are things uh, that are expected and there has to be clarity, uh, but there has to be clarity also about the use of force. What are we ready to do, you know, to uh, actually implement that mandate? Because if we ask the countries and the commanders of the force to uh, put the lives of their troops on the line, <coughs> then uh, the council has to be clear about what it is that it requests, what it is that the consequences that it is ready to live up to, the council, uh, and of course uh, the troop contributors have to be clear as to the extent to which they are ready to do the job. I've been fighting a constant uh, fight to get rid of uh, caveats. Uh, caveats are not in the logic of uh, peacekeeping mandates, but they are even worse when the existence of a national caveat appears during an operation, when a commanding officer of a unit refuses the order of the force commander, 
calls his capital, so whomever, and says, no, I will not do it, you know, and that is something we simply cannot accept. Uh, so all these aspects, the role of the council, of the contributing countries, of other actors, I think there is a, a need for a new uh, sort of framework of cooperation amongst the partnership that is peacekeeping. Second issue has to do with communication, you know. Clearly, you will never be able to have a peacekeeper behind every civilian on a given theater. Uh, so uh, we cannot be um, a tool that can deal effectively to deter and contain very large scale and sometimes, unfortunately, state sanctions, uh, violence. Uh, but we need also to be clear with the local populations that they cannot expect everything uh, from us. They can expect a lot, but of course the primary responsibility lies with the host state. Uh, and uh, the host state has to be made fully aware of what the consequences will be for it if it fails to do what it is expected to do. Uh, again, something to clarify uh, between the Security Council in particular and the Secretariat. Third, of course, has to do with capabilities. Uh, we need adequate uh, uh, tools, uh, civilian and uh, mi military, uniformed, to do the tasks, um, which means a very realistic uh, assessment of the threat, um, of the ability to adapt or to readapt. There, of course, it brings to mind the fact that the civilian component of our mission is uh, absolutely essential. We have civil affairs officers, uh, we have, uh, of course, the role of the police that is uh, uh, essential. We have all the specialized advisors on women, on children, on uh, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, all this uh, means that we have to be permanently in a position to adapt and to, um, to be able to face uh, all these uh, issues. And there, of course, we need uh, further investment by the member states. Uh, because, uh, uh, in particular, in the civilian field, I mean, we dealt with the uh, military pledges in the peacekeeping summit last year, the London Ministerial three weeks ago, but also we need more pledges in the civilian field, and I think Ireland has committed, uh, as other countries. Uh, I think it's good that uh, we, we mobilize uh, the best uh, tools uh, possible. All this, of course, uh, with the constant concern to ensure the best level of uh, performance uh, and conduct. Also, we should never forget that peacekeeping operation is not an end in itself. It's a tool. It's a tool towards implementing a political process, a political solution. Uh, if there is no viable political strategy, uh, then it's a bit pointless, you know. It's costly. It's uh, costly in human lives. It's costly in money. It's costly in political capital. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to have a process, you know, that will show the way uh, and benchmark possibly uh, what is happening. Um, and even when there is uh, extreme violence, uh, there has to be some prospect, and this, to come back to South Sudan, which is a bit of an obsession with me these days. You know, I knew nothing about the Sudan until I joined the UN uh, five years ago. Uh, France uh, ceased to be interested in the Sudan in, I think, 1898, when uh, Colonel Marchand was uh, halted in his progress by Lord Kitchener in a place called Fashoda. I flew over it, by the way. Um, so, no, for French it was terra incognita, but the more I go to that country, the more I invest time and efforts in it, the more shocked I am. And in South Sudan, clearly, there is no political process. I think uh, it's, it, it's an impossible situation, yet we have to keep trying to forge a political agreement uh, to have a way out. Um, so uh, this really uh, is a matter of redoubling effort with the strong support of, uh, in particular, the European Union. A new country uh, can do a lot, I think, uh, leading by example, drawing on 
your historic experience, you know, the courage, the determination, the uh, constant trying, uh, I think that forces admiration and it gives you maybe uh, more credibility than other countries who had uh, a less uh, complex history, if I could say. Uh, well, for you to, to consider, you know. Um, the second issue I would like to, to mention, sorry for being a bit long, is uh, women, peace and security. I think we have made uh, important steps in the implementation of the agenda since uh, 1325 was adopted. It's clear that women has to play their rightful role, that should be, they should be at the core of collective security in post-conflict countries. The London Ministerial Summit was very much um, insisting on that uh, angle and, well, I think the message was made there yet again that peace is more lasting when the voices of women are heard and are, most importantly, acted upon. So it's been incumbent on us to develop uh, robust structures to integrate deeply, you know, the uh, gender issues in the framework of peace and security, to develop policy, guidance, also accountability mechanisms. And I think we've made some progress. Uh, we have now gender advisors in uh, every head of missions office, uh, in all missions. Um, uh, we have developed a uh, women politicians network, just to give a few, a few examples. But Clearly, it remains a challenge in many places, uh, uh, and there is still much to continue to do, uh, and um, doing really the mainstreaming of gender at all levels will still require many efforts. I mentioned it, accountability is the key. Uh, leadership has a role to play, and, um, and I mean me, including, you know, from at every level of the organizations, um, we need to engage yet further in uh, work plans, in compacts, and it's not easy. My predecessor at the head of DPKO, rather maybe foolishly, signed a commitment, you know, that uh, before 2015 we would have 20 percent uh, women in UN police. At the time we were at 10. Well, today I'm still bound by that commitment, but we're still barely at 12. Uh, so I failed on my compact, you know. Uh, but it's a matter also of dealing with the sociology of uh, world police forces, where some are quite advanced in the percentage of women they have on board, some are way behind. And can we be expected to do much, much better than national police forces, uh, there's a, a real question there. So we have this uh, forward-looking uh, strategy on gender that uh, uh, also insists very much on the needs for further partnerships, in particular with the civil society. We have uh, a number of mechanisms, I'll not, not go into them in detail, but let me say again, this is a matter of priority, high priority. Uh, so. Of course, I could have talked to you about technology, about uh, uh, the need to, ne to develop an intelligence policy, which to my mind is something absolutely essential and critical for the future of our operations. But I thought these two issues were something that needed uh, particular insistence. Uh, but we can only do that with the support of um, member states, of partner organizations, of course, as I said, including uh, the European Union. Uh, the support of your country, Ireland, will remain very uh, critical. But of course we need to continue looking uh, ahead. Uh, we have to do a better job on a day-to-day -day basis, but we also have to think about what is it that peacekeeping might look like five or ten years from now. And what we see today is already maybe a prefiguration of that when we see the problem of Daesh. I've made it very clear in my tenure, and that has been endorsed by the membership, that peacekeeping is not, and will not be, and cannot be, a tool for anti-terrorism. We have never been designed for that, we are not equipped for that, we will never find the troops 
or the police to do that job. Uh, so what's the solution? Coalition of the willing, intervention of a parallel operation like the French against the, the jihadists in Mali, maybe? Uh, various uh, possibilities, but I think there is going to be for the new Secretary General and uh, his team a need to, you know, reflect about uh, those uh, future uh, dimensions and finding the proper way ahead. Uh, and this, of course, again, while implementing the uh, reforms accepted by the membership uh, at the end of the HIPPO and other reviews uh, last year. So, all views are welcome. Uh, Forward-looking we have to be, there's no doubt. But at the same time, uh, knowing the limits of uh, what it is that uh, we can do. The example I give always, one of the three basic principles of peacekeeping is the uh, need only to uh, fire to your weapon to defend yourself or the mandate. But what do you do when you have in front of you a uh, bunch of guys from the Ugandan rebels ADF in northern Kivu uh, who rape and kill every other night uh, whole villages uh, and they threaten you? No, of course you have to shoot. Huh? Uh, you have to be robust. So the lines are moving. The problem is to know to what extent, until what point, and at what point perhaps a change in the tooling uh, will be necessary. But that will be for our successors, of course, to consider in due course. But in the meantime, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for being so numerous. And uh, thank you again, Ireland, very much for your splendid contribution to our efforts over so many years. And we look forward to continuing that. Merci.